Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for the virtual opening of the Arlene Schnitzer Visual Arts Prize Exhibition. My name is Mariana Ramirez, and I'm the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at Portland State University. This is our first event of 2021, and the first exhibition I've had the opportunity to work on since arriving here a few months ago. I am absolutely thrilled to share with you tonight the amazing work of three artists and recent graduates from PSU, uh, PSU School of Art and Design. Chris Blackmore, our first place winner, Roshni Thakur, our second place winner, and master artist Michael Bernard Stevenson Jr., our third place winner. You'll hear from all three artists a little bit later in tonight's program. The Arlene Schnitzer Visual Arts Prize was created in 2013 with a gift from the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation to raise awareness of the quality of art education at PSU and to honor Arlene Schnitzer, a very much loved and inspired leader of art and culture here in Portland. While I've only been here a few months and I did not have the privilege of knowing Arlene, I have heard so many wonderful things about her since I've arrived. So many wonderful stories about her caring nature as well as her astute eye. Even today, as I was talking with a colleague about tonight's event, uh, the colleague started telling me about Arlene's wonderful spirit and how she truly loved nurturing artists. The endowed award ensures that each year, three aspiring artists and designers will receive significant recognition and a financial boost as they begin their lives as active creative practitioners. This is the largest and most prestigious award in the School of Art and Design and I am pleased to have this year's exhibition at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. And I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to you, Jordan, and your team, and our friends at the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation. You've been such a wonderful partner uh, to me, the museum, and the university, in addition, of course, to all of the wonderful things you do for the city of Portland. I am very, very grateful, and I would really appreciate if you could say a few words for us. Hope you're on mute. There we go. Hear me now? Great. Okay. Well, first, uh, uh, welcome to Portland. Um, uh, I've been delighted. You've spent a lot of time with uh, our staff, and uh, I just think there's a, you're, you're a, 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 a great experience, and and we're excited about all the things to come, especially as we get through this COVID time. Uh, my mother. Uh, here's a picture of her. She's uh, right there with my uh, older daughter, who just graduated, and uh, she's with us in spirit. Um, as many of you knew, uh, know, my mother went to, to the uh, PNCA and uh, opened a gallery when I was in the third grade. And I think she deservedly got a lot of credit for helping uh, open the first contemporary art gallery in Portland. And more important than that, I think, because uh, that's just bricks and mortar. But the way she helped uh, nurture and, and showcase the amazing artists we have in the Pacific Northwest, Portland, Seattle, some from San Francisco, if there's a legacy for her, it was more than just, just the paintings and the building. It was helping foster a spirit of, of getting people in this community to appreciate the importance of having art in their offices, their homes, and their lives. And uh, that's a mission that uh, I've stepped into her shoes and we've continued that with our big art exhibition program and so many things we do. Uh, the, 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 the Arlene Schnitzer Prize of Portland State was a, something she was especially proud of. And um, the last time, uh, actually at the opening of the George Sitcher Museum of Art, she was not able to make the, pri the, the award prize, uh, would have been two years ago now, uh, but she did come to the opening of the museum and was able to meet uh, the winners. And I remember going downstairs and going over to where the, the three winners were and she was talking to them and she just became so energized and uh, her passion uh, just flowed through uh, to all of us around her. So I've said before, for me, waking up with art around me would be like waking up without the sun. Uh, art inspires us. Uh, it, it takes us away on a journey, and most importantly, it forces us to deal with issues in society. It grabs us and shakes us up, and I was astounded by uh, the quality of the work, and I've only seen the images on paper that, um, that you know, Chris and Michael and, and Roshan have done, and this is one of the most frustrating times of COVID because I want to be there in that space seeing that work because I know that it will jump out at me and speak to me differently than where you can see on a piece of paper. 
So first, uh, thanks to the, uh, the um, uh, jury, amazing people to spend a lot of time going through, uh, I'm sure, a, a large number of submissions. And it must have been a tough, tough choice to pick uh, uh, the best of the best. And um, uh, you're off to a great start. Uh, the world needs art. We can say this more than ever. And those just can be platitudes. But the reality is, with all we've gone through in this country, in this world, COVID, protests, you name the, the issue, uh, art is a way to help us understand our own values, uh, societal values, and bring us together in a constructive healing way. So your work is challenging. Uh, I, I can't wait to be there and swept up by the, uh, the imagery and um, uh, the, the energy you've put into the work and um, uh, you're to be commended and, uh, and just wish you well in your, your, your life effort to help in uh, uh, change the world and help us all understand ourselves and help make our communities a better place to be. So on behalf of my late mother, uh, she's right down there looking at us, uh, cheering you on and uh, congratulations and uh, thanks for being part of the amazing Portland State community uh, they, uh, every day, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in their classrooms and in other meetings and just around the whole Portland State community uh, are helping um, change lives and inspire people to go on and uh, make this country, uh, make our community, our state, our country, the kind of place we want it to be. Congratulations and can't wait to hear you talk about your work. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you everyone for joining us to celebrate the 2020 winners of the Arlene Schitzer Visual Arts Prize. My name is Liz Charman and I'm the director of the School of Art and Design. Each year through this prize, we get to celebrate and honor the incomparable legacy of Arlene Schnitzer, who understood the importance of encouraging young artists like Chris, Roshni, and Michael. I am so proud of all three of you for your incredible original work. Uh, before I recognize um, the 2020 prize jury, I want to quickly uh, thank our fabulous art and design faculty. We simply could not have such exceptional programs and students without the guidance and care each of you provide. Thank you for your time, support, and mentoring that you give to our students and to our school. Uh, next up, I want to recognize and thank our esteemed 2020 Arlene Schnitzer Visual Arts Prize jury who took special care to make sure the selection was thoughtful and a deliberate process. The first person is Horia Baboya, Professor of Art Practice at PSU, Kate bingham Bert, Professor of Graphic Design at PSU, Lisa Jarrett who's here tonight, Associate Professor of Art Practice at PSU, Jordan Hogben, brand designer at Nike and the 2013 Arlene Schnitzer Visual Prize recipient. Kelsey Schnook, who is a freelance designer. Ashley Stoll Myers, the former Robert and Mercedes Eicholtz director and curator of the art gym. Sarah Meggs, who is the founder of the Lunder, uh, Lumber Room. And Linda Tessner, former interim director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at PSU. Mariana, I'll hand it back to you to introduce the 360 tour so we can look at the work. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. Now, while the museum is currently closed, uh, we have two exhibitions currently installed, Building Community, PSU Art Design Faculty Past and Present, and our Arlene Schnitzer Prize winners. I am truly hoping that we can open the museum soon. In the meantime, we are working on creating um, an online presence for both exhibitions. I'd now like to share with you a 360 video created by our friends at Forever VR. This video is available on our YouTube page and we have a more extensive 360 tour on our website. Both links will be dropped into the chat momentarily. I'm master artist Michael Bernard Stevenson Jr. and this is an installation called Educate to Liberate. The triptych draws the gaze to the center which is a reproduction of the 1968 photograph of Black Panther Party co-founder Huey P. Newton 
holding a shotgun and a spear. In the reproduction, I can be seen holding a toy AK-47 and a social distancing stick I made for a picnic project I did over the summer with Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. Flanking the portrait are a bookshelf and pamphlet rack made by Blue, a formerly incarcerated art partner who was contracted through Past Lives LLC. The pamphlet display features the first series of informational publications produced by People for Mutual Education with the second series slated to launch during the exhibition. The bookshelf is the physical manifestation of the Afro-Contemporary Art Archive and Artist Index, which is a project supported by the Special Collections Department at Portland State University Library. I'm Roshni Tagore, and I'm a socially engaged artist who graduated from the Art and Social Practice MFA program. Most of the work I do is as an artist in residence at the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, also known as APANO, a social justice organization located in East Portland, as a newcomer, I use my artistic practice to understand a sense of place. This is a body of work called The Past, Present, and Future, according to Portland's Communities of Color. The works were made since I moved here in 2017 and are in collaboration with communities of color currently living and with histories in East Portland. I was thinking about traversing through time and putting this body of work together. At the start, histories of displacement of Black and Asian Portlanders sit next to a redesigned family history of a community member. Family and food are very present, with quotes from a local Fijian restaurant owner framing a collection of recipes for visitors to try in their own kitchens. Next, revolutionary ancestors have the backs of anyone who wears these lab coats while they try out their experiments in the East Portland Art and Justice Lab. With these layers of time, multicolored visions by BIPOC community members will be growing throughout the exhibition of what needs to happen and what can happen between now and 2042, when the U.S. has a multicultural majority population. My name is Chris Blackmore, and this installation is titled Last Night, which was designed around my work of young adult interactive fiction by the same name. The installation immerses the reader in the visual styling of the interactive experience by placing the audience in an ethereal dorm-like setting. The looping chat message on the iPhone at the front entrance invites viewers toward the computer to play the game. The goal of this digital experience is to provide a safe place for teens to experiment with the nuances and boundaries of ethical sexual behavior. Players navigate an archetypical college party scene and make decisions about consuming alcohol, pursuing hookups, and testing friendships. Sex is explored in scenes that reflect real-world scenarios in which consent is often assumed due to body language, shared histories, or physical proximity. There are 14 possible endings, some of which involve your character getting hurt or hurting others. Well, I hope you all are as impressed with this, their work as I am. I agree with Jordan, it's not quite the same as being in person, but I think if you um, get a chance to visit our website, you'll be able to explore and get um, the next best thing. I would now like to invite um, associate professor in the School of Art and Design, Lisa Jarrett. Um, and she was also one of the advisors to the students um, as they pulled together their projects. Lisa. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, it is a pleasure and really an honor to be here, particularly with these three fantastic artists. Um, we're going to get into a conversation in just a minute to hear a little bit more about their work and their ideas. But I did want to start by thanking Jordan and the Harold and Arlene uh, Schnitzer Care Foundation uh, for establishing this amazing opportunity for our students. As uh, Mariana mentioned earlier, this is one of the most substantial financial contributions, philanthropic contributions to young artists that are, that are coming into their professional practice that we're able to offer in the School of Art and Design. And I did have the pleasure of knowing Arlene for a few years, um, and I just wanted to share anecdotally what her impact actually meant to me. So when I came to Portland in 2013, um, very much uh, as a result of Arlene and Harold's generous support of the James DePriest Visiting Professorship in Art, 
Um, I had the opportunity to meet Arlene at one of those, uh, one of these celebrations that was happening in person and what was then Newberger Hall. And um, the opportunity to meet Arlene and to actually talk with her about what it was like to have the kind of impact that she did beginning in 1963 with the Fountain Gallery um, was incredible. But more than that, to watch her engage with young artists, young undergraduate and graduate student artists around their work was just really, really an inspiration in a lot of ways for me. Um, because it wasn't just, oh, here's a gift and I'm so happy to be able to give this and, and help you out. She would go in and talk with each artist about their work in like these really critical ways. It was amazing to see that what the students had been preparing for in their classes and in their research was actually able to benefit them in a conversation with someone who quite frankly changed the landscape of what uh, the gallery system looked like or actually began it in, in, in many ways here in Portland. So um, I do miss Arlene's presence at, at, at actual in-person openings in Jordan. Um, uh, all of our condolences to you for, for, for such a substantial loss at such an unusual time. Um, and I also wanted to, before we had a moment to speak with each artist, I wanted to take a second to invite Chris to share some thoughts that I think she was interested in, in um, communicating with everyone this evening. Chris. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, Roshni, Michael, and I wanted to extend our gratitude to you, to Mr. Schnitzer, and to the Harold and Arlene Care Foundation. We are incredibly grateful for this opportunity to present our work in such a beautiful museum and for the prizes that have allowed us to expand our creative practices. This has been a really great learning experience, and I know it's helped all of us as we continue to grow in our careers. We also wanted to thank the jury for their time and deliberation and our amazing art and design faculty for their encouragement, mentorship, and guidance. Um, I especially wanna thank my mentor for this project, Meredith James, who can be here this evening. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. It means a lot to hear from folks and just to sort of like express our gratitude, but my, the most fun that I ever have with the three of you, and I know each of these artists in different ways, I've been working with you as collaborators, as former students, and now as current friends, um, as you've emerged into different places in your lives and work. I thought it would be really nice to be able to share some of the content of your work with the audience that's with us today. And so I have kind of three primary questions that I'm interested in us exploring together um, about each of your practices. And please feel free to respond to each other's comments. And if the conversation, if it can be more conversational, I think that that would be really generative in, in a lot of ways. So I'll open with a question and whoever wants to kind of jump in and, and launch us off, uh, we'll start there. And one of the things that I've noticed uh, when I look at each of your work, even though you, you each kind of have different directions and, and deep commitments to the communities that you're interested in, in working with, um, I noticed that you each have a deep interest in how, how your work can function beyond the context of the museum. So yes, there's an audience that comes in and yes, there's an audience that gets to appreciate the ideas, but I think for each of you, the work really lives when you get to have this work exist in community. And so I'd love to know what that really means to each of you on a, on a more personal level. Um, and maybe maybe I'll start with Roshni. Like who's gonna go first? Um, <laughs> thanks for the great question, Lisa. And also thank you everyone for being here and for this opportunity. Um, it's really nice to share space together. Um, yeah, I'm very influenced by the Cuban artist Tanya Bergera thinking about the usefulness of art. And so um, that comes up in, in the things that I create right now. I feel like um, the, and it's funny when you, when thinking about this question, because um, I kind of already see these things happening in the world already. And so it's like taking the things that are in the world translating it into an art piece that is also like revamped and taken into the world again in a, in a transformation or in a translation of that. And I think a lot of the, the pieces that I think about like for the zine that I'm, I um, created, that was supposed to be a collection of family recipes to create these monthly dinners at the Art and Justice Lab. 
Um, and then COVID hit. And so I was like, well, these recipes are still pretty great. How are we going to, to um, get these out here? So because of the exhibition, it was a great opportunity to create and work with the, um, the folks that contributed their family recipes in East Portland to create these zines. And, and maybe when the museum opens <laughs> for the public, people can take those zines and try the family recipes at home. So that's just one example of spreading and sharing the ancestral knowledge, the family knowledge of these different communities um, and bringing them to other domestic spaces. Thank you so much, Roshni. Um, Michael, when you hear that, I mean, I, I know that parts of your practice also navigate food, although that's not the work that we're experiencing in the context of this particular exhibit. Um, how do you think about your, your work being activated outside of the museum or maybe the relationship between the two? I mean, I do think, I mean, the conversation is interesting or like buttressing the work with formal um, framing, just like, who it's, the community is and who it's for, like we're all humans. And so I don't know that work is ever not political or is not some way in the community. Um, and so it's just interesting to be thinking about that in this like current moment um, for myself at least. Uh, but I mean, I think at this point, most of my work exists in the community. Um, and that, uh, I mean, it's interesting also to refer to your art practice as work, it's like, a beyond full-time job and in many ways um you know you attend to it like any person would their own life um and so that is actually where the work is and so it's actually a fun and interesting opportunity to use the gallery as a space to bring all of those things and kind of focus them in in a way where in this kind of cultural context we are taking a hyper focus on the work or the art so to speak um, and it allows viewers of art to look kind of in the microscope and see actually further and wider. And my hope is that actually that inspires engagement, um, but really the work lives in the community. Um, and um, this was a, a privileged opportunity given my own background in object making, et cetera, to um, weave those two things together. So, um, but, uh, yeah, and I just also wanted to, to thank the opportunity to take all of those different peoples and communities, formerly incarcerated, young people, scholars uh, working towards like anti-Black sentiments and, and be able to put that in this place um, to be viewed um, in this strange time, which much of this, including those pamphlets and PDFs are on the website. So I've like immersed myself into the internet um so that this the community work can still be happening um and that work can be accessible in a wider community uh now that we are closer in a weird way thanks michael your optics are really working for me here um hey chris i actually wanted to invite you in on this this question too and i i think it's a, a really interesting question i think that each of you have work that's existing sort of and with desires to, to really motivate people to think differently. And with last night, um, so much about this project is really about illuminating what consent looks like for young people and the questions and concerns we have about that. Um, I'm curious for you, what does it mean to set a work like this in the context of a museum? And does it have an opportunity to exist outside of a museum? Yeah. Um... This project's been really interesting for me because it kind of started as um, my partner's MFA thesis. And that's where we did like so much um, of our like original research and primary research for this project. Um, and it was then kind of like we translated it into this idea of like, well, how can we take this like piece that was meant for a gallery and make it something that could exist outside of the gallery in the form of um, like a game or playable media. And um, so that's where this idea really came from. So it's been really interesting to then translate it back into the gallery format and back into to, to design an installation and an exhibition 
for something that wasn't really meant to um, exist in as an installation. Um, and yeah, so I think that I'm really interested in this piece being something that could be used as a, in like a sex educator's toolbox as a piece that um, is engaging and kind of meets young people and teens where they're at um, and um, provides just like something a little bit more interesting and out of the box um, that, they, that they can follow along with and maybe take some lessons from. And that's why on the website I have um, a discussion guide for a download um, that can be used by, by parents or progressive sex educators. Um, and beyond like the more institutional, I just kind of think about that idea of um, like with fiction writing, which is like write what you need to read. Um, and I think often about, um, you know, what did I need to read at that age? And that's kind of where a lot of this came from. Um, did I, when um, I was that age, I was growing up in a pretty like sex negative culture. Um, my, you know, we didn't really have um, like consent education at all. We didn't have, um, you know, sec uh, really much sex education beyond abstinence only and definitely no education regarding um, like interpersonal relationships, how you have an, like healthy boundaries with people. And so I just kind of imagine like that teen who's like alone in their room one night who stumbles upon this and like it might plant some seeds for them of like those ideas of like that maybe if they have heard about consent that like it is a little bit more complicated than the yes it means yes no means no formula that's been taught and um that maybe like plant some seeds to hopefully um encourage some introspection towards emotional intelligence and critical thinking about their own relationships thank you chris that makes a lot of sense and i, I think i'm interested because in one way Rishni and Michael are, are coming from a different direction, right? Um, and, and there's an invitation in your work that's really about trying to figure out what's happening here and understand yourself. And, and each of you are really thinking about specific communities within your practice. So Chris mentioned this word primary research. Um, and I'm actually really curious to understand from each of you, not so much how you define primary research per se, but what does research mean to your practice? And maybe what does it look like? Uh, it seems like kind of an ambiguous idea for artists a lot of times. And I'd love to, I'd love to know how you each approach it um, and what it means to work within your communities as part of your research practice. I feel like I was selected, um, but I do have an answer. Um, and I mean, it was interesting. I, I agree the work together feels it, that it's in concert, like a discussion, if not only because it is like rooted somewhere and is like also referential back to that place. Um, and so, yeah, as far as like research goes, I mean, which is a fascinating question, I think generally is anyone's life not some form of primary research, um, but also in the specific context of a lot of what is on display for me in a way that is actually unique different from or not normal uh, to my practice, like actual historical research um, that is like visible on, on quick pass, uh, but also um, is interesting, like um, a lot of the things I'm doing is also generating educational content for redeployment, um, as well as like the archive itself is actually just a bank of knowledge. Um, and also like, you know, and Roshni mentioned certain historical figures, you like mining kind of the, peop the people and po like people who've built and knowledge in the past and leveraging that in our works. Uh, I, Roshni, are you thinking of some similar overlap? Yes, I was just thinking of like, we've had such great training of, um, 
of incorporating research practices in the socially engaged practice um, through the program and everything. And I, I kind of see it as a parallel as like um, urban planning or like architecture or just like trying to understand the site, the context, the social context, the community that you're trying to um, uh, make work in with. Um, and I um, am super influenced by um, alternative kinds of research where you could actually just interview people. You can have conversations. You can have like, you know, lived experience be part of your project because that's as valid as some kind of scholarly article. And so I think what I like, I totally nerd out on like going to the library or whatever and like finding the history of site and, and so much of the work that it, that I've done is um, since I moved to Portland is the figuring out like what's happened in East Portland, thinking about the annexation, thinking about like incorporation, all of these things and why and like, and how is the neighborhood and uh, is it being shaped and who's making those decisions and like um, those kinds of things and actually incorporating the voices and the um, beliefs of the people directly impacted by um, those decisions and um, trying to create spaces for more like equitable decision making. So very, very, very important to have research in my, in my um, practice. Chris, what's your, what's your take on research? Like, what does it look like for you? I'm, I'm really, I'm totally curious. <laughs> um, this is the most like, I think, sort of kind of like Ro Roshni was discussing like 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 library-esque um bit of research I have done for a project a lot of the time I have done a lot more um kind of I would say research that wouldn't like pass an IRB <laughs> um and through um finding ways to like repurpose like online dating platforms to interview people about consent and stuff like that. So this, since it was my thesis project for, um, for my program, there was very much a structure to this where, um, you know, it, it started before the class with um, research I had done and like through some development um, that I had done independently and then um, a lot of it, I did a ton of research around um, just like things like studying different types of interactive media um, was like a whole term for me and trying to figure out what this project should look like um, and how it should be structured. And then I spent another term um, looking more closely at like the current research on consent education um, and looking towards researchers like um, Dr. Jennifer Hirsch and Dr. Shamas Khan and the research of um, like Peggy Orenstein, Erica Boas and Jason Laker who are all like um, doing a ton of work in that area. And at first I kind of like thought I didn't need it. I was like, I know about consent. I have, you know, I, I read the internet. I know these things, but um, all of those researchers just really opened my eyes to like, especially like the pressures college students are facing, um, the way that um, gender affects like the power dynamics and consent and the way class and race are affecting it. And so there was very much a, a much more linear research project than um, I've typically made in the past. And um, I just like knowing things and discovering things. So I've, I feel like the nonlinear kind of um, way of researching things really suits me. <laughs> Okay, okay, so yeah, okay, very, very great. Now I wanna know about the collaboration part because to me, uh, for each of you in really different ways, there's both been research and collaboration and Chris, you talked about it and you know, sort of saying, this started with my partner's graduate project and it's sort of grown into these other, these other things and ways of showing up in your own work. And I think there's a lot of collaboration here too, but Roshni and Michael, 
I also know that for you all, this work wouldn't exist without collaboration in any way, shape or form. Um, and so what does that mean? What does collaboration mean to you as artists? But broader question, what does it mean to contemporary art practice? Um, it's, it's interesting that we have three artists uh, where collaboration is so important to their practices, um, albeit in different ways. So who wants to tell me about collab? Well, I, oh, go ahead. We all have like, <laughs> I'm just I I like want to like this is such an important thing and it's um I remember um before going into grad school knowing that my practice wasn't complete um without involving other people and so being able to be in grad school and really understand that and formalize that has actually pushed it to a level where like it's actually like decentering the artist and making it more about what can happen between a set of circumstances, a set of people to create something new. And um, I think that's been problematic for me in thinking about claiming work um, because I really do believe in like collectivism. And, um, and so having this um, show, it's been like strange and, and, and like um, being able to have this opportunity to show this work. And so that's why I had to like bring in Alex Chu to help bring the um, mural happen and, and John and Kara Harrell to like make sure the, the font for the text comes in and then like the representatives of Tony Tony's family. So it's just like, it's always, um, I can never do it alone. And I've always like wanted to try to visualize that in my practice, in the work and whatever opportunity to show this kind of work because it is a, a more of a collective effort than anything else. I love that, Roshni. Like that, I, I mean, I feel that same way about like, I could never do it on my own, even though it's something that I think like, I, I especially because I'm from a design background, like it's often mm -hmm. we really um, idolize like the superstar designer in my um, field. And I just, often feel like I don't want to center myself in my work and I am always singing the praises of everybody who has any part in this uh, and like the things that I make because like truthfully I'm always better and like the work is always better when I involve more people and um like this project definitely wouldn't have existed without my partner, Simon Boas, and then like all the other friends we made along the way, um, like the community at um, UC Santa Cruz, um, where he did his MFA thesis and like my community of peers and mentors here at PSU GD. Um, like in a way I consider like everybody who's had like a hand in it in some way, like my collaborator, um, because it's just, I think so important to um, bring in like diverse perspectives whenever um, you have the chance. And um, yeah. I love this question because I just love that collaboration really does not mean one thing. And as I'm looking at Michael and thinking like, wow, what's Michael gonna, add to this like because I you know I'm kind of guessing as I go like ooh, what are they going to say I'm looking at like the Huey P. Newton reenactment behind you Michael that you're disappearing into as we watch and I can't help I mean this is my own bias too but I'm thinking about what it also might mean to collaborate with an historical legacy right um or a, a person or a persona or an era or a, a movement like the Black Panthers for example that um doesn't look like it did at the time that that image was taken, but still has a real life right now. What direction, if you were gonna, if I just said collaboration go, what would you say, Michael? Sure, I mean, I think you like recontextualized another layer and before you drop the collaboration question was gonna ping when Chris was talking about like not quite IRB research. It's like, there is this component to life or academic work that is benefited by like well-researched stuff, but, also, I mean, not well research, but like academic research that's going in that direction. But a lot of the research in the context of this or of my entire practice is, as Roshni mentioned, like direct connections with people. And so I think even 
even where this work landed was actually lo and behold it was all a trick of the whole time you inspired it right when we were build working together to build the afro contemporary art class yeah. idea you're like well what about emory douglas and i had no idea who emory douglas was and so literally and through this project the amount of uh, in person and academic research, my brain is like bursting. Literally, it's like I just an archive. Just put it in the archive. Um, but yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, so it is in community and collaboration that I was even actually guided to the Black Panthers movement. Not that I was unaware, but gave me a reason and an avenue to explore it. And then in community with the students of the Afro Contemporary Art Class, eight students for a whole year co-navigating this content, me researching it just so I could teach it to them. And then they're taking it in a whole new direction. And it takes us into the world, into the Portland Art Museum to see Hank Willis Thomas. And then also, and through a feat of the, the giant smallness of Portland, was able to uh, talk with Kent Ford, former Black Panther, who started the Black Panther Breakfast Program. And then the kids were like, this is cool, let's do it. And then they're doing it and I'm meeting like the caterer across the street and Kaysen's meet and now I'm running around and I meet the executive director at the Northeast Coalition of uh, Neighborhoods in the event. And now we're collaborating on the pamphlets and the gentrification. And so like, as you're running, and that's what I said, the, the work and the politics and the community organizing is inseparable. Even if you're like just doing printouts, you're running from one place to another. But if you're like, working with people, learning their stories, having it guide the work, their hand is making it, you know, and even this installation, um, the woodwork was made by, as the video suggests, art partner, uh, Blue, who, who, I mean, I can make things, but I spent the award money on making it, and I was able to Ponzi scheme it and buy a stop saw because the guy's starting a business. And so now he has a tool. And so that's, and also what I was meaning, like leveraging the platform by funneling the things that we're doing together in something that can sit on the wall on the nice French cleat that they made for it. Um, art handler style, you know, ready to go. Um, that platform allows also then to look, as you said, collaborating with the historical figure it is so dense. I've been studying it for years now and I feel almost just at the cusp of it. In fact, this woman named Coletta who knows Emery Douglas was like, I showed him your poster and, and she wants to talk to me on Zoom. So now I'm like getting a community, an international community. And also as I study the Black Panther movement in solidarity with oppressed peoples all over the world. And as we kind of suffer through that together right now, and did we ever really liberate ourselves in the 10 point program? It's in the Afro Contemporary Art Today newspaper. Go to the website, download the PDF, and you will see we are still working through the original 10 points. Um, and so um, it's there, it's immersed. We're immersed, we can't escape. Um, and it's a beautiful thing um, that all of our work, that's what I was saying before, it all is in discourse with um, the wider world, et cetera. Yeah. So. It's really exciting to sort of see the ways that, that the work overlaps and actually reaches out um, um, while still acknowledging and, and valuing what it can do for folks that want to come into the museum and learn about something that way, because it then gives them a place to move as they move back out into the community and some real learning um, and, and also some really just beautiful expressions of your ideas. Okay, so as an aside, the 10 point, I just read that today to a class less than 45 minutes ago, and it was really a lovely experience. Relevant. So all of these, these sort of ways that these things converge is exciting to me. That said, I, you know, this is like, there's one thing that I always get frustrated by when, when, I, when I talk about art with people or when I'm on a panel and no one ever asks, like, what do you love about your work? What, what turns you on and what gets you up in the morning? Um, like, why is this your passion? Um, maybe if it's not this project, you could talk to us about other things within your practice that, that really excite you. Um, I think that if Arlene were here to speak with you, she would ask you that and she would mean it. And that was, that was sort of the thing that was important to me when I, when I would observe her working with her talking to students or when I had an opportunity to chat with her briefly, she really wanted to know what motivated you 
and what was exciting for you? Like, where's that, like, sort of that, the love moment? Roshni. <laughs> um, yeah, I, there's a few, <laughs> um, I have a few answers. One, I can't do anything else. Like, this is what I'm just like, I need to do it. I have to do it. Um, I can't imagine doing it other things. Um, so there's like not a choice really in, in that way. Can I, just, you, can I, can I, I'm, I'm sorry, can I insert a, a question really specific to you too? So since, you know, your work has really bridged into this very intense relationship, meaningful relationship with an Apano, as you mentioned earlier. And for me, I think that that seems like a very important and relevant space for you to be practicing. Um, and you, you wear different hats within community. So tell us a story, like what's something that happened through all of these things, right? These things that bring us together and bring us into your work. We see what's happening in the museum setting, um, but we also see lots of families and recipes and food. And I know you think a lot about these things. Where's like, tell me a story. So if you see behind me, there's a piece, I don't know if you can see, um, there's a piece um, done by another brilliant Portland artist, Lynn Yarn, um, who I think is third generation Japanese American um, in Portland. And she, uh, we commissioned her to do this piece to um, excavate and really talk about the the history of the Portland um, Japanese farmers um, before the executive order, um, where East Portland was thriving with um, Japanese farmers. And there isn't a lot of history, like documented history of East Portland generally. And so a lot of the research, it has been like talking to elders and talking to um, getting some, so their personal photos and like getting those stories. And so we were able to host a lunch. Um, my amazing collaborator, Candace Kita and my boss, Adapano, um, with the Japanese elders. And so Robbie um, Andato, um, Jane Ikichawa, and then um, a few others and, and those, their family photos are in that piece. And it gave like me and Candace just to hear directly about stories of what life was like before like Canton Grill was there. And that was like 75 years old already. <laughs> so to think about like that place as like farmland as like um, Japanese farmers thriving and like um, selling like 60% of the produce in um, Portland. Um, and having markets in North Portland too, or Northeast Portland as well. And so just having that um, connection to history right there <laughs> in a relational way, that was kind of mind blowing. Thank you so much. I just, I really love the stories that come out of the work that y'all do. And um, Chris, I would love to hear from you too on that front. Like, what is the thing that really makes you sing when you think about your art practice? Um, and it could be a story for you, but it could be something entirely different. I love this because I always work with you as a designer and that like client designer relationship and which is brilliant and you're brilliant at that. Wonderful, but this is a, a whole different way of getting to know you. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on, on your practice. Yeah, I mean, more broadly, my practice, I think of it as kind of like points of entry for empathy. Like that's kind of what I'm always trying to create with each different project. Um, and that seems to be like a common thread among them, um, regardless of the actual subject matter or, um, you know, the specific topic. So, um, you know, I do a lot of work about sex and consent because that's really important to me and like um you know exploring like the nuances and boundaries of consent is something that i think um needs to like come from like happen more in our society from a place of like trying to understand as opposed to um like bad dogging and like making things like um, I, I think that I tend to approach it from like more of a public health issue uh, as a public health issue and to, in order to like really um, to start thinking about solutions to like the problem of 
um, like campus sexual assault and stuff, we need to be looking at it from a lens of like, okay, what's going wrong? And like who is suffering? And it might be um, a lot more people than we think in this case. And so, yeah, specifically, um, you know, doing work around like sex and consent is really important to me. And um, I want to like, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I don't know how much of an impact any of my work will have in and of itself, but I hope to contribute to a broader cultural conversation about it. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to a critical mass one day um, where like things continue to improve and um, a deeper understanding I think would go a long way in terms of but like then you know for projects that don't actually have to do specifically with consent um, like I have a project where we read nice things to people on the other side of an Alexa because um, what a lot of people don't know about their you know smart home assistants is that um, people transcribe all the things that get said to, um, you know, somewhere at, in some Amazon facility. And so um, I'm thinking about with, you know, those projects with thinking about like having empathy for the worker on the other side of that device who's being timed down to the second um, and to like transcribe faster and faster and to treat uh, who has to treat every bit of like utterance that they read as just like neutral data, even if it's hate speech, even if it's, um, you know, like really violent language. When people actually direct like a lot of violent language towards their home robots, which is, um, I think, a very interesting little part of humanity. Um, but I, I want to open up like why when people are alone, do they feel like they can, they should like be saying these things and um, instead of approaching it from like, well, people shouldn't be doing that. I think it's worth like, you know, using that as a, a point of investigation and to really think about how, you know, when we notice these things, how can we then like begin to make them better? And when, once we turn our attention on them, how can we then um, start thinking about improving the world for everyone. Huge. That idea of empathy is really strong in all of your work. I, I, I see that. And I, I actually see that in Roshni and Michael's work as well, uh, albeit although it shows up in different ways. Um, Michael, we have just a few more minutes before I'm going to go for the, the flash round here. So prepare yourselves for my pop question round. Um, <laughs> Michael, any thoughts on this, um, this idea of just like, what, what, what gets you up in the morning? Like what, what is your, what's the passion part of your work? Um, yeah, I mean, and it was great to show work with other people because there's a lot in the room that's also like in my uh, body as well. I think, as you said, like, what's a story? There's so many stories, there's so many people. Um, and I, I plan to do a lot of actual subsequent programming to try to like unpack some of these things like you have been to you've co-presented with me and I was like one more slide one more slide um there's just a lot to try to do and I think in many ways that my life is full in that way um like it's not even just to consider or be thinking about like I, the term bored does I don't even know what that means um uh, overwhelmed feels like a close friend um but I do I think like Roshni said like what else would I be doing like in a way there's some form of this being so natural to me that it's miraculous even to myself that I like somehow have not crashed and burned or something um and you were also you know present for the dynam reception conversation and there was a conversation with funders about like unrestricted grant really cool thank you and has totally literally kept me out of the poorhouse and also I know you gave it to me for this one project but my life is not one project it's like a billion different things um and it is in some forms 
actually the overlapping and weaving of those things that even allow it to be possible. Um, and as Chris said very much directly, like there is something to be said about being in discourse with the grandeur of society and like, will my work do anything? Who knows? I, it's, I'm, I think I'm closer to the mark than if I was collecting a paycheck. Um, and like, also I have these anecdotal stories, like just going about my business and Kent Ford, former Black Panther is like, oh man, like I go wherever Mike goes. And I'm just like, you know, the awards are great and they keep the lights on. Um, and I uh, not only appreciate them, but they, it is just, and this is like, I'm in conversation with King right now about trying to like pivot curriculum, decolonize it, get the community stories in there. I'm gonna meet a bunch of more people. Um, but I keep telling them like, look, like if you can't find the money, I literally don't care. I'm going to do this anyway, <laughs> uh, because it needs to get done. Um, we're, we're too far behind on those 10 points. Let's check one off. Come on before 2074. Let's do it. Uh, Afrofuturism today. It's really just nice to hear you, you all talk. I mean, because in art, there's so much, you know, deep thinking and like problem solving and getting things to the place where you feel good about sharing them with the world, even if they're actively participating in the development of the project. So it is just really nice to hear what drives you and what stories just sort of emerge when you're just invited to talk about those, those parts and pieces. And I know they're not always easy or happy stories, um, uh, but, but they are the things that actually motivate the work and the reasons we come back to our work continually. Um, I did have a power round, but I think we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna save that for the next time. It'll, I'll save that for next time. Um, but I do wanna thank each and every one of you for spending a little bit of time talking with me in this way. This is not a way that we usually engage with each other. So it's, it's felt really wonderful. To, and, and, and I feel honored to be the person that gets to have this conversation with you that gets shared out to so many folks. Um, and thanks so much to my colleagues who have supported this, this particular award for so many years. Um, and to Jordan and to the CARE Foundation, um, it, it, it has really changed what our students are able to do and how they're able to realize the particular projects that they're interested in, in shining a light on. Um, so with, with gratitude and thanks to everybody else out there who I can't see at the moment, but we really appreciate you being here. Um, and there is, uh, you can certainly access this exhibit via the virtual exhibition website, which I think is gonna be in your chats. There's also a tour, an online tour that you're able to see. And when the museum is accessible again, either by appointment or during limited open hours, um, I do hope you get a chance to see some of this work in person. Um, it is absolutely stunning and phenomenal. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Mariana uh, and, and thank everybody for their time. Lisa, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you've considered having a talk show, but I would watch that. <laughs> Put in the back of your mind. <laughs> Michael, did you hear? I think she's talking to you. <laughs> um, I would like to thank everyone for uh, sharing their evening with uh, us tonight. I really, really appreciate it. I would also like to say it takes a village to put on a Zoom event. And I would like to thank Emily Stenas, Alex Gonzalez, Adrian Burke, Ryan Rusty and his team, Echo Monetti, Karen O'Donnell, Stein, and all of our panelists tonight. If you all are hungry for more conversation, check out our closing slide for more information on a panel that Michael will be on this weekend. Thank you all again, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I feel like I'm pinned. If people are here, definitely check out that event. Uh, it's going to be really cool. And also all the things we said, it is like people's experiences that actually inform the work. Um, and um, I'm really actually excited about this is kind of like the public Black History Month thing that I'm doing, um, but is actually going to be a conversation between me and other multiracial people um, uh, in collaboration with people from mutual education and Van Port Mosaic. And so, um, and it will be in the archive, uh, but again, just reflecting on that these embodied experiences are like 
so incredibly important. Um, and they, uh, as I'm finding out in exploring this project, are actually minimally documented. Um, and there's an exciting opportunity to unearth those things and uh, learn and benefit from them today, right now. Yay.